This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and ConstructionBusinessAccelerator.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and it's my job to help construction business owners and leaders eliminate chaos and maximize revenue. I've got a great interview with Nicole Landau for you today. Nicole is a CFO, a chief financial officer who helps construction business owners improve profits, streamline back office processes, and control costs. That sounds pretty good, right? How does she do that? She does it by providing industry-specific construction accounting, construction software integration services, which we'll talk about, and virtual CFO services. She's an outsourced CFO. She understands construction financials. Here's what you're going to get out of this interview. You're going to learn about the number one mistake Nicole sees construction business owners making when they do their own accounting. You'll also learn about the pitfalls you need to watch out for if you're part of, or especially if you own a family-owned business. You're going to get some great advice to help you with your cash flow. You'll also hear about some dicey situations you should watch out for related to workman's comp. Also, we're going to talk about some misconceptions and best practices about outsourcing. And you'll learn about what does a CFO do? What would a CFO do for your business? And we'll also talk about a financial dashboard. What is it and what should be on it? But before we get into that, I've got a few resources, a few things I want to talk to you about. The first is an app that uh, I found out that's pretty cool that I think will help you out. So let me ask you this. If you if you own a, um, or if you manage a project, if you manage a crew on a construction site, what's one thing that drives you crazy? If you said dealing with all the communications and trying to make sure that everybody has what they need, then you're not alone. Here's what construction management is. In my opinion, you're an information broker. You're trying to get the right information to the right people at the right level of detail at the right time. So that's what you're doing if you're managing a crew or managing a team. And frankly, text messages are huge on job sites because they're they're great for getting information across quickly and everybody knows how to use text messaging. But the problem is these messages are not stored in one place. They're hard to manage and hard to stay on top of. And because the messages don't get saved or organized and they're not searchable, it makes it impossible to refer to conversations later if there are ever disputes. So there's good news though. I recently discovered an app called Field Chat. Field Chat is the ultimate text messaging platform specifically for construction sites. It alleviates what I call the Bermuda Triangle of information between the field, the office, and the client. The, B- the Bermuda Triangle is where information disappears and it gets lost. What Field Chat does is automatically organize all of your instant communications by project, giving you an organized, searchable history of all messages. It also integrates with text messaging, so it's easy to include anyone in the communication, whether it's someone on your team that refuses to learn technology, do you know anybody like that, or a trade or sub that just prefers to keep using text messaging rather than downloading something new. So what I want to know is where was Field Chat when I ran my construction business a few years ago. I needed a tool like this to keep operations running smoothly. Instead of having all these fragmented conversations that left important people out, and then there were commitments that were made that I could no longer find proof of. Frankly, I hacked together a system like this several years ago that wasn't quite as good as this, but this is a beautiful solution that's off the shelf. So here's what this tool means. What does Field Chat mean to you? More time, less chaos. Field Chat will accelerate progress while reducing mistakes, reducing rework, and reducing chaos by making project communications more effective. And right now, Field Chat's offering you, the construction leading edge listener, 15% off. Just go to fieldchat.com slash edge. In fact, you can get your free trial there right now and see how it feels to have communications that free up more of your time. Go to fieldchat.com slash edge. E-D-G-E. Check that out. It will help you get time back and eliminate chaos. A couple of other things I want to talk to you about. People ask me, uh, Todd, what do you do? Do you work with construction companies? Do you have some sort of one-on-one coaching or mentoring program? And the answer is yes, I do. Um, I work with a select group of construction business owners to, to help them ultimately have the lifestyle that they want by putting systems and processes and growing their business in the direction that it needs to grow. So um, instead of talking about everything I do, I'll just share what some other folks have said about it. 
and you can read some of these on my website. Rosalie said, thank you for all you do for the construction industry. We definitely wouldn't be growing if we hadn't joined the Construction Business Accelerator. Let me say that again. The Construction Business Accelerator. Um, one of my, a couple of my coaching clients, Matt and Katiana, said this, we're finally making the money that we deserve to be making. Not only do our financials look better, but we are so much happier motivated and excited about the future of our business. And if you want to listen to my entire interview and, and hear more about what Matt and Katiana said about working with me, you can go listen to episode 106 of the podcast. You'll also find out how and why they said they got a 10x return on investment. Another one of my coaching clients, Neil Sundrish, shared his experience working with me one-on-one -on -one in the coaching program on episode 99. So if you want to hear what some other folks would tell you about working with me and my coaching program, go listen to episodes 99 and 106. And you can also go to my website, constructionleadingedge.com. And if you want some resources, then go there, click on the big red button that says webinars and training. Lots of stuff there. I have webinars on, uh, let's see, how to build a healthy backlog, nine mistakes that are killing your sales, my number one tip for fixing your cash flow, as well as a free video series, The Secrets of Successful Contractors. So go there, go to constructionleadingedge.com. If you would like to get some free resources, click on the red button that says webinars and training. And if you want to talk to me about my coaching program and how we might work together, how I could help you get where you want to be. There's also a red button there that says book your free call. The first step in learning more about the coaching program is to schedule a free strategy session with me and we'll find out if we're a fit and uh, what the future might look like working together. So that's that. Um, here's something else I, I, I want to tease you with. This is a, a program that I'm thinking about and you let me know if this is something you're interested in. What would you think about how would it be if you, what would it be like, let me just put it this way, what would it be like if you own a construction business, if you could travel one week every quarter, if your business had the systems and the people and the processes and the workflows and people were doing the things they needed to do so you could get away from your business for one week every quarter. Some of you might be thinking, I, I can't even get away for a day. Listen, if you can't get away from your business for a day, then that's a problem because that doesn't mean you, that means you don't own a business. That means you own a job. That means you're handcuffed to your business. That means you're working for your business instead of your business working for you. That means you're stuck working in your business instead of your business, instead of working on your business. So something I'm going to start rolling out and you'll hear more about this is working on a program where I will show you how to set your business up in such a way that you can get away from it for one week, a quarter, maybe even one week out of the month. What would that be like? So keep your eyes open, watch out for, for that. If you want more information about that, if you're like, I need that right now, then uh, go, send me an email, todd at constructionleadingedge.com, and I can keep you posted on that. Okay, so now, without further ado, let's get into the interview with Nicole Landau. Nicole, thanks for being on the podcast. How's it going today? Great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we chatted a couple of weeks ago, and I've been looking forward to getting you on the podcast because I think you've got a lot to offer to construction business owners when it comes to their financial situation. Um, so let's start here. What is, we'll get into your background in a few minutes, but what's the number one mistake you see construction business owners making when they try to do their own accounting? Just like in construction, um, everybody talks about cheaper is not better. And I think that's the same. That's true on the accounting function side as well. Um, you really want to have somebody that understands construction accounting. It can be very complex. The job costing is a whole new level of accounting on top of understanding the industry. Um, construction's complex anyways from lien waivers and general liability insurance, workers comp. So then adding the job, the job costing on top of it 
is really expensive. Um, so I would say cheaper is not better. When you're trying to do it yourself, um, find somebody who is focused in construction, that that makes a huge help. And I think in your podcast too, you talk about, um, you know, knowing your worth, how much is your time worth? If you're doing the data entry yourself, I think in your podcast, you talk about a thousand dollars an hour is how much it costs somebody. Where can that thousand dollars be better spent out in the field, doing the sales, doing the marketing, being the face to the customer. Um, so spend that time and spend that money somewhere else and let somebody else focus on the accounting for you. Um, so Cheaper is not better. You will pay for it in the long run. I've seen it many, many times. And um, not every construction accountant is the same either. So find somebody that you're comfortable with and somebody that you want to work with long term. Yeah, good advice. Um, and I want to talk about job costing in a minute because that's kind of a mystery to some folks. But um, yeah, to elaborate on the $1,000 an hour thing, I recorded a podcast. It's episode 79 where... I lay out 10 things that are worth a thousand bucks an hour for a construction business owner. And I think I referenced the conversation I had with one of my clients who was doing his own bookkeeping, keying in every invoice for a company that was doing like three or $4 million a year. And um, I told him, dude, you gotta, you gotta find somebody else to do your bookkeeping. He talked to a bookkeeper, got all excited about it. <clears throat> and then the next time we talked, he was pretty bummed out because he said, well, it's going to cost $80 an hour to have somebody do my bookkeeping for me. And he was like, I can't afford that. I said, hold on, let's look at it this way. You're spending four hours a week doing your own bookkeeping, keying in data entry mm -hmm. in QuickBooks, hiding behind your computer. Um, if, if I gave you those 16 hours a week or 16 hours a month back, how much work do you think you could sell? Is it worth $1,200 or whatever, the, whatever that was? And he was like, oh man, I could make 10 times that money. Mm -hmm. So why, why haven't you signed up this bookkeeper already? So yeah, let's not look at reducing. I think contractors are so focused on reducing the wrong expense, trying to reduce all costs. And they really should be focused on reducing what I call opportunity costs, which is doing something really low value at the expense of doing something really high value. So yeah, definitely. And, and I can tell you, when I talk to a construction business owner, if I find out they're doing their own bookkeeping, I tell them, listen, you suck at it. You're not making any money doing your own bookkeeping. Go pay somebody to do it. You'll make money and you'll get better results. Absolutely. Um, so job costing, what does that, if somebody wants to get started in job costing, what, just start start there. What, uh, what is it? What's the benefit? How can they get started? So job costing is really taking all of your expenses per project. So you want to break it down per project so you know how much you're spending in each category, but then really taking it and getting it down to the different category levels, drywall, painting, roofing, um, trim and carpentry, um, then get it into like subcontractors versus in, in, um, internal labor, versus materials. So really breaking it down so you can slice and dice um, what all those costs are. And it really helps you um, going forward when you go out and bid the next project. So you're tracking it today. What are the current projects? Let's track it against our bid and then see where we are. Did we bid well on those jobs? And what do we need to track going forward? Do we need to track something differently? Or maybe we bid it wrong. And how can we bid it better next time? Um, I think the one thing to get started is really just to um, take your bid, what you have in what categories, set up that bid, but then also mirror that in your accounting software or your construction software, wherever you might be doing your detailed job costing and track against those line items. If they're not mirrored exactly, you're not doing it correctly because then you're um, not comparing and you're not seeing your true variances. Um, so really getting it side by side to see where you're at is basic job costing, I guess, in a nutshell. Yeah. Makes sense. So if you're not job costing, then you're sort of flying your plane with no windows. Absolutely. No idea where you're going. Um, you're continuing to bid on work. Imagine this. What if you're continuing to bid on the type of work and you're consistently losing money mm -hmm. project after project and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the, the situation. Some people, if you're not job costing, then you really don't know. Um, mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're not even breaking your expenses down by project, you really have no idea. So it's, it's imperative that you get some visibility, you get some yeah, visibility into your financials. So you know, are we making money on this stuff? And it gives you the, the levers you can pull to increase pricing. Maybe you can get more aggressive in some areas. Maybe you're overpricing stuff and that's causing you to lose work. Maybe you are underpricing it and you're losing money, but it gives you the visibility so you actually know what you're doing. Um, yeah, so obviously every type of accounting software out there allows you to do this. There are plenty of systems that allow you to track your financials within the project. And we'll talk about how to integrate those systems and how to get them to talk to each other in a bit. But let's back up and talk about your background. So you've got a bit of a unique story about why you chose accounting with a specific focus on construction companies. So I would ask, what's a, what's a nice girl like you doing in construction? <laughs> I, I don't know. Where did I go off track? I guess. What, where did you go wrong? Um, so growing up, I always, I loved math and math was kind of my passion, but then for some reason, and I don't remember what triggered it, but I wanted to be an architect. I thought I wanted to be an architect at one point in my life. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Yes. So in high school, I signed up for every woodworking class that I could, every shop class, um, architecture class, drafting, CAD, Um, And I took it all and I was the only female in all my classes and I did really well. Um, One semester we had to take a project, we come up with our own project, we had to draw it out from start to finish and then build the project. So it was really rewarding to see that all the way through. And then my senior year of high school, I had a volleyball coach who was also the accounting um, teacher and talked me into trying her class for a semester. So I committed to one semester, said I wouldn't do any more than that. I'm probably not going to like it. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And so I was there the entire year. It just came natural. I had a passion for it. I really enjoyed it. And so then when I got to junior college, I picked up accounting again. And it again came natural. Um, I ended up majoring in accounting. I tutored other students in the business school, really enjoyed it, um, and then launched my career in accounting, working for a healthcare company and then a retail, and then went to the dark side of internal auditing for any accounting people that are listening. Went to the dark side of internal audit, um, worked for the fifth largest public accounting firm, and then really said, what am I doing? Is this really what I'm passionate about? Um, I loved being the advisor, but how can I be the advisor, accountant, um, CFO for clients, but also coming back to the construction? And so that's where I launched my firm, um, being that advisor, but really marrying the construction piece of it too. I, I love all the people that I work with and I have a passion for the construction and the trade so I can Um, relate to what they're doing and follow all of their projects and love seeing what they're building too and helping them on the financial side. So it it came full circle after a long time. um, And I I really like it. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you didn't become an architect. (laughs) That was, that was good. Sorry for any of you architects out there, but every chance a construction guy gets to take a shot at an architect, he will do so. (laughs) Um, So let's talk about cash flow. This is one thing that many contractors struggle with. It's a mystery to them. They just don't know how to get their arms around it. So what what advice would you give them today? Maybe some things they need to think differently about, common mistakes. Just what advice would you give to folks listening who are struggling with cash flow? So the one exercise that I always take my clients through is let's think long term. What's the exit strategy for my business? What am I trying to accomplish? And what is it going to take to get there? So recently I had a business owner. He shows $3 million on the books, but he never has the cash and didn't understand what was going on. Where was his cash leaking? Um, so we, we went back to the business model. What are you, what is the end strategy? What are you trying to do at the end? He has him and a business partner. And at the end of the day, between both of them, they want to have 20% take home every single month. 
So we worked it backwards and said, okay, what's your cost of goods sold? Your revenue, what are you billing every week and every month? What's your cost of goods sold? And then your overhead. And in his formula, he was saying that his true cost of goods sold was around 55%. But when we really dug it in um, and took a look at it, he has one employee and he subs everything else out. So his true cost of goods sold was closer to 75, 80%. And with the math, that's just never going to work. Your revenue is 100%. Your cost of goods sold is 80. And then you have to take your overhead from that as well. So the math never worked. Um, so really just digging into that um, and understanding the numbers. So work it backwards. And Todd, you talk about this too. And there's different ways to do it even um, there's profit first methods and um, how you get to that number and how you get there, but really setting down, taking the time to understand the numbers. Cause if you don't know the numbers, again, you're flying blind and you just, you have no idea. You don't know where your cash flow is. Um, so work it from the end to the back. And then that will help you also know how much do you need to be billing on a weekly, monthly basis and how are you going to reach your goal? Amen, sister. That's exactly what I, I teach my folks is start with the end in mind, work from, I call it working from right to left, mm -hmm. figure out your numbers, know your overhead. If you don't know your overhead, if you're listening to this, if you own a business and you don't know your overhead, you need to pause this podcast right now, go figure out what your overhead is. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that you've got that figured out, then we can talk about some other stuff. So it's very important you understand what your numbers are and then that you have a target. So many people, they get to the end of the month and they're like, how did we do? And they, they only find out when it's too late. It's all rear view mirror. And right. it, yeah, this, there's, a, there's a much better way. And, and in fact, big successful businesses do exactly what you're talking about. They say, this is where we need to be and then work backwards to figure out how are we gonna get there? What are the targets? What do we need to put in place? How much do we need to invoice? Then what kind of work do we need to sell in order to support our plan? It's just a, it works so much better when you, you operate that way. Um, so mm -hmm. certainly that's going to help with cash flow long term. Uh, what about short term? Do you have any short term strategies for people who are, they're just in, in the cash flow crunch right now? Um, so it really depends on the business model because I have some clients that are doing fixed fee and they kind of, they don't look at their cash flow. They just kind of pay out invoices as they go. I have other contractors who are um, time and materials. They invoice, and so they know exactly. It works for them. Um, it really depends on each contract, but as they build and they're paying out. But I think going back to the number of knowing how much you're going to have to pay every single month, um, but also then again, set up a target. What is your target to have in cash flow? What is your reserves? Um, and obviously I can't say, oh, it's one or 10%, like, because every business is different. 10% for a billion dollar company is a lot different than 1%. Mm -hmm. So it, it really varies depending on the size of the company, but really have some money set aside, um, for those rainy days. And you never know when something is going to happen. Um, and you got to know your numbers too, on your accounts receivable, um, how many days outstanding, are your clients paying for you, paying you? So how can you speed up that process as well as going back to knowing the numbers? Um, but really, I think for today, um, find out what that reserve number is and how are you going to get there? Yeah. And I would, I agree. Put the, and then put a plan together. Let's generate some, some reserves. Let's sock some money away to put into the cash reserves because to me, cash reserves equal freedom and peace of mind. I, I've been in a situation where I had no cash reserves in cash flow crunch, and then been in a place where I had plenty of cash reserves. And that gives you the freedom to operate strategically, make the moves you need to make, and not have to worry about robbing Peter to pay Paul and all of the sort of stuff you have to do when, when cash flow is really tight. So um, good advice there. You mentioned succession planning or transition planning for, for and frankly, every business owner should be thinking about this. At some point, there will be a transition plan, uh, whether you want to or not, there will be a transition plan. So it's better to start planning for it. Um, what are the, what, what advice would you have for someone 
in that situation? Maybe they're, well, how far in advance should they start thinking about this? What are the, some of the pitfalls and mistakes you see? But just talk about that a little bit, if you would. So I think this goes back to our overarching theme that kind of be, is kind of what we've talked about all day is knowing your exit plan. Um, I would say start planning sooner rather than later. I recently had a father-son um, business come to me and they have a five-year plan, which they're starting to think about now. The father wants to get out of the business, but how is he going to get out of that? Um, so they're looking at their balance sheet and they're looking at their debt, their credit card debt and some other debt that they have on the business. But the, right now the son cannot buy out the father, can't buy him out in the company and the father's not ready yet. So they have a five-year plan, um, but they know that they're gonna have to go to the bank and get a loan for the son to buy out the father. So one of the first things bankers ask is we need a profit and loss and we need a balance sheet. And most business owners don't understand the balance sheet. So they just slide the piece of paper across the table and say, here you go, I hope this is right. <laughs> um, so with this cleanup project with this father and son, we took a look at their balance sheet and um, their receivables were not correct. Um, their payables were not correct. And then also some of the um, equity section wasn't correct. So we're really getting that cleaned up so they can present a true picture of what their business really is. That way um, they can present it to the bank and they can get more favorable terms. They'll get um, better loans, um, better rates, and they can tell the true story of what their, what their business really is doing. Um, so it's really having a plan. I would start thinking about it sooner. Is it something that you're going to have to sell to somebody because getting investors involved, they're going to look at the balance sheet as well. And they're going to want to know how is your business doing? I want to know that this is a profitable business. So you need to be able to tell that story through your balance sheet and your profit and loss. Um, so it's not something you start thinking about today to sell tomorrow. It takes time and you really want to have a plan of how are we gonna get that exit strategy and what's it gonna take for us to show an investor or the bank that we're worth buying and we're worth loaning against this business because we are doing good um, projects and a, a very profitable business. So the sooner you think about it, the better. Um, that way you know who's next in line. Um, and it's not just from the financial perspective, it's also the operations and the management. Are they gonna be able to step in that role and continue the business and be successful as well? Do you have processes in place, the right people in place to take over the business? Obviously you have put everything you have into your business and you don't wanna see it fail. So it's some of the non-financial um, pieces you need to think about as well. Yeah. Um, you want to own a business, not just own a job that disappears when you do. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the balance sheet, what, what are for the folks who maybe aren't that familiar with it? What does a, what does a P&L tell someone? What does the balance sheet tell someone? What are they used for? Just start with the basics. Yeah, so the balance sheet is really taking your assets, um, your bank accounts, but then also your fixed assets. So you might have equipment that you've bought, you might have trucks that you own, equipment, um, computers, and then that gets depreciated down. So that's still part of your assets of what you own on the books um, and you're not showing it on your profit and loss. And then you also have your liabilities, What lines of credit, credit cards, what do you owe other people? And then your equity, how much have you invested in your company and how much is your company valued at? So the balance sheet really stands alone. Um, and I like to take it, the balance sheet is something that you manage off of. You take it and you look forward. So that's where like the CFO level services come in and you're taking a look at the forward thinking. Um, you're doing some analysis and ratios of your accounts receivable, um, taking a look at how often you're collecting, what is your turnover, and then also your payables. How fast are you paying on your payables? That's telling me that I have cash flow, I'm managing my business, and I can pay what I'm taking on. I can pay my subs, I can pay my loans, um, and really thinking forward. Your profit and loss is your revenue minus your expenses, and that gets you to your net income. And that really tells the picture of where you are 
right now at a, a um, throughout the year, what you're doing in business, your actuals, um, and it's really taking it and looking backwards, I think, is looking at the um, profit and loss and see how I did for the month, how I did for the quarter, for the year, and um, looking a little bit more backwards on that. Got it. If, uh, if somebody were to ask you, what are the th three or four metrics I need to be looking at on a dashboard report? You know, the red lights, green lights, what are the, the few numbers, three or four numbers that I should really look at to give me the best picture of my company's financial health? What would be at the top of your list? I would say really your gross profit. So taking your revenues minus your gross um, your cost of goods sold gets you your gross profit and that's per project base. And where a lot of people struggle with this is, um, your gross profit, it, I call it will be your dividing line. Um, so then anything above that is above the line and anything below, like your overhead is below the line. So making sure that you're getting all of your cost into the right category, that it's, if it's job specific, you're getting it above the line. Um, so one of the, one of the main factors or one of the main matrix is looking at your gross profit. That way you can see how much you're making per project before any overhead or anything else. Um, also taking a look at your accounts receivable and accounts payable aging reports are two other um, reports that are really important. Um, the last thing you want is a lien placed on you if you're not paying your accounts payable fast enough. Um, you want to know what's outstanding and what's coming due and getting those paid so you're, you're current. Um, it also affects your business credit. If you need to go down that path and have to open a line of credit, um, you want to make sure that that's happening. But then you also want to make sure that you're um, collecting in a reasonable amount of time. You don't want to be chasing down payments and having to write off invoices that you can't collect on. So I would say those are the top three, um, gross profit by project, accounts payable and accounts receivable aging. Good stuff. And if someone is looking at the, uh, the ratio between their accounts receivable and accounts payable, where, where should they be? What's a, what, what's a good range for that? It, um, so I will, I will say it depends. It's the accountant, um, <laughs> the accountant word. It depends. It's like because, a lawyer. Um, <laughs> sometimes you'll have commercial projects where you have contracts to where you don't pay until you get paid and then you have retentions. So it depends on how your contracts are structured, but you definitely want to make sure if you are, um, that if you do have contracts in place with your subs that you're meeting those um, guidelines and that you're following them. Um, I would say anything over 90 days is a red flag big time. You don't wanna be over 90 days um, in your accounts payable, so below 60 days, but there are times when you don't get paid, so you don't pay, so it's a trickle down effect. So make sure you're, you're following your own contracts. Gotcha. You mentioned um, <clears throat> a CFO a few minutes ago. What does, what does a CFO do for a company? What are the key results or key areas that they focus on? What, what are the, well, let me ask you this way. What would a construction business owner get out of having a CFO either full-time or outsource involved with their business? So a CFO really focuses on the future and the future planning, the strategic vision. The CEO of the company has a strategic vision of what they want to do with their company, how fast they're going to grow, how fast they're going to hire, um, what their number is going to be. And then the CFO does the analysis of, okay, this is our plan to get there. Just like putting a budget together. How are we going to get there for this year? What is our plan for this year, our three-year plan, our five-year tenure? and really looking forward, um, doing some modeling for you, um, working with banks if you need to go in and um, talk to the banks to get lenders, or if you're talking with investors and really telling the story of where you're headed and really projecting going forward. Got it, got it. Another uh, hot topic right now, in construction would be workers' comp expenses. And I've seen folks who are 
getting in trouble here, maybe paying more than they need to, and maybe there's some opportunity for savings, but what advice can you give folks in this arena? So right now what we're, I have a, um, I'm located in Denver, just south of, um, just south of Denver a little bit. And it seems like there's one insurance company that really dominates the Colorado market. But once you start to get out on the national level and you start to do research on workers comp and find out what your other options are that you're not tied to that one company just because they're in Colorado and you do a Google search and that's who comes up first. So I would say really find something that works for you and shop around on rates. Um, but then also when you're doing it, I have a client that's in Virginia and they just went through their audit um, probably about three, four months ago. And just they really spent the time to sit down and understand their policy with the auditor while the auditor was on site. And they came to find out that there were more codes that they could report on their workers comp that they weren't doing previously and it's at a lower rate. So they specialize in deck projects and like sunrooms and they were always lumping those costs into a different category and paying more for it. So really, I, I know people hate auditors and they hate being audited It's part of the process. But if you spend the time and sit down and ask questions and Maybe you'll find out more of there's more codes that are available for you that you can report at. So really digging into um, finding companies, what are your options? And then are there codes available that might be at a lower rate because of your specialty for your business? Yeah, I've got an example of this. A friend of mine who owns a roofing business, he posted something on Facebook and said, I started using this time tracking app and it saved me $12,000 last year on workman's comp. And somebody said, how did that, how does that work? How are those connected? And he said it was because I was able to track the time that they were working on different codes. So he set up his, his uh, hourly different codes for whether it's drive time or in the shop, certainly being on the roof is a much higher risk activity than being in the shop. So he just set up different job codes and maybe he paid the same hourly wage, but mm -hmm. because he was breaking their days up into different activities from a workman's comp standpoint, just doing that saved him $12,000 a year. And this is a, this is not a big business. So mm -hmm. huge opportunities there. Absolutely. And then also when you're doing that too, and setting up, you might be tracking it in your software in your accounting software, but then when you're reporting it, if you use a third party payroll provider, make sure that though that information can get reported because usually when the auditors come in, they want to see it by that code and they're taking it off of your payroll records, not from your construction software. Mm. So you want to make sure you understand when the auditors come in, what are they going to be looking at and how do we have to report it that way? You're doing all this extra work to get it into the right codes, but then you're not paying it by the extra codes will they still accept it? Great advice. It's amazing how, how many opportunities there are to either just save money by mm -hmm. setting your processes and system up, systems up the right way or avoid a lot of pain and heartache in case of an audit. I've been audited by insurance companies, workman's comp, IRS, and it's, it's so much easier if you have it all set up and ready to go as opposed to having to go back and reinvent everything and recreate these records. That is, that's incredibly time consuming. So great advice there. Um, let's talk about one of the, the issues in construction today is the proliferation of different systems. So we have bookkeeping systems, time tracking systems, project management systems. I talked with some folks yesterday who have this text messaging platform. That's pretty cool, pretty cool for communicating but sometimes they don't talk to each other or maybe they do talk to each other. They will talk to each other, but we just don't know how to do it. Um, so talk about that. This is something you work with getting different systems to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So most of my clients will have a construction specific software that they want to um, have more capabilities in that the accounting software doesn't do for them. Um, so it might have a portal or something that the end user can use, their clients can see. But the problem is they think that they're going to buy it off the shelf and they're just going to click run and good to go, turn it on and they're good to go. But then 
they don't spend the time or they don't know how to get the construction software to talk to their accounting software or they get frustrated and they just give up because they don't have the time and so they're half using it half not some areas they're using some they're not and so it really defeats the whole purpose of what they're trying to do um, and i get that a lot and then i also get the question of what software do i do i need to use um, it really depends on what you're trying to go for too there's a lot of solutions out there but the biggest um, thing that I see is that business owners don't take it to the next step and really get it implemented the way that they should and then train their people how to use it. They get out in the field, the guys get out in the field and some are using it one way, some are using another, some aren't using it at all. So then their records are all over the place and they just have no idea. So then that throws off your job costing. So really getting it implemented and if you don't have somebody in-house or you don't have the time to do it hire somebody to do it for you um, we do that as part of our services as well as we'll come in and we'll get the softwares um, we know the construction softwares that are being used and we will implement them to talk to the accounting system and get them to flow so you get good reports um, there's a lot of factors in there but just take it all the way through and don't invest in it today. Think you're going to take it off the shelf, spend all this money and then just let it sit because then it's a waste of time and money and energy. And I would say having a, a poorly implemented, poorly adopted system could be worse than mm -hmm. having no system at all. Because right. It's just extremely frustrating. So yeah, that that's a good, that's a really good point. If your expectation is that you can sign up for a service, sign up for a piece of software, and then it's just going to magically solve your problems and it will magically implement and that there's no learning curve, then you're going to be pretty disappointed. So understand that there's going to be this hump in the effort curve where you're going to have to invest a lot of time and energy on the front end. And my advice is to make sure and do it, really invest the time and energy, make sure you have the resources and the time to do that so that you get it implemented properly. Mm -hmm. So it, otherwise you're going to end up with loose ends and hanging chads and all these problems for months and years, and then people will just stop using it. Right. And then you're, you're very frustrated. So that's, that's good. I talked to um, several, I know several software companies and they've talked about this exact need, uh, need for outsourcing the implementation or the, the training. So, Hey, we're willing to sign up for it. Um, but we can't take our people, we don't want to take our people out of circulation and fly them to your place for training. Can you, can you send somebody to do that? So there are options available for that. There are people who can help you do that. And then this is something that I've been working on is creating a, a platform for connecting contractors who, let's say they use co-construct and they need help either getting implementation set up for co-construct I'm working on building a platform to connect those folks with people who can do that implementation and the training, coaching, and then even work inside co-construct, sort of like outsourcing to a bookkeeper to work inside uh, QuickBooks or Sage or any other sort of uh, um, bookkeeping software. You can, there are people out there that you can outsource your project management inside the software. Just imagine if you could find somebody that could do the implementation for you, and then they could actually do all the stuff for you. And then you could just outsource it all. That's, I think there's a tremendous opportunity there for that, as well as estimating and several other activities that people seem to think they need to hire a full-time employee for, but I think there's a better way. There's, there's a way to, to do it on a contract or outsource or freelance basis. Um, so that's good. Just recognizing that there are other ways to do this than figuring it out yourself. Any other um, advice when it comes to integrating systems for people who have these, uh, maybe it's advice for either buying software or implementing systems that you can share with folks? Um, I would also say have a dedicated resource in your company. Um, don't have like multiple people trying to figure out how to do it, even though that sounds great. But really what it does is it slows down the process. And when you're implementing new processes, business doesn't slow down. You're still picking up new projects every day, every week, every month. Um, business is running full steam ahead. And before you know it, it's busy season. 
So when you do implement it, assign it to somebody and say, this is our timeline. This is what we're shooting to do. How are we going to get it implemented and let's get it figured out and get it going. I've seen people that um, buy it and they've spent six months of trying to implement it. And so then it's useless at that point. Um, they can't go back to those projects. You don't want to go back in time and try and get all these projects updated. Mm -hmm. so you have to draw a line in the sand and move forward. Um, so really set a realistic timeline based on when you implement it and what time of year is it? Is it your busy time or is it a slower time where you can um, make it go really fast? Um, so I would dedicate somebody. And I think that's one of the benefits of outsourcing it too. Mm. That's their sole, sole focus. That's their engagement. They're going to get it and they're going to run with it and they're going to get it up for you really quickly. Um, so that's one of the other benefits. If you don't have a dedicated person in house, like you talked about is just to outsource it and get it going. Yeah, I, I agree. I think handle it like it's a project in and of mm -hmm. itself, because it is, it's a project that requires time and energy and resources, information, equipment, software, et cetera. And I think it's a great idea to bring somebody else in who's going to say, all right, we're going to have calls once a week, every two weeks, here's our time frame. This is what I need from you and hold people accountable and drive this thing to completion. Otherwise, if you try to do it in your free time, it's just never going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, that, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. So speaking of outsourcing, um, what, what are some tips? If somebody's thinking, oh, man, I, I would love to be able to outsource estimating or bookkeeping or something. I'd love to tap into these people from, other parts of the country who can help me with these things on an outsourcing basis, but I don't know where to start, or maybe I've got these, uh, I, I don't even know how it works. What are some tips for people? How could, how should they think about it? What advice would you give them if they'd like to start outsourcing? Um, so I will say one of the limiting beliefs that people have when they're considering going down this path is that they need to have somebody in house right. doing it yeah, for them, absolutely. which is not true. Um, with technology today, there's apps that you can get everything into the cloud. You can get everything to your outsourced provider without them being in house. Um, and then you also reduce your cost as well. You're not having to pay overhead and benefits to them and they're not setting an office. You don't have to have office space. So I will, I would say that's one of the first things is getting over that hump of, okay, it's okay to let go of some of these tasks because I need to do other things and I can still get them the information that they need. And maybe there's apps out there that I don't know about or technology that I don't know about that they do. This is their go-to do it. Um, I would also look to see, um, I would search for construction accounting specifically. Um, like we talked at the beginning is, um, construction is complex. It's very different than doing construction for a um, service industry or something that's a little bit smaller. It's just more complex and um, need to know the ins and outs of it. Um, so really find somebody who is specialized, but also somebody that is going to help grow your business. Um, we can hire bookkeepers and data entry specialists all day for 10, 15 bucks an hour, but are they really going to do a good job for you? You want to make sure that they're doing the job costing and they're really helping drive your business too. A lot of people look at accounting as a sunk cost, but really it could be a return on your investment. Mm -hmm. It can help you grow and help you see things that are coming that you don't have time to stop and think about and take a look at your financials. They can keep you aware of what's going on um, as you continue to grow. So really finding somebody that's um, construction specific, somebody that's going to help you grow, um, but somebody you also like working with. Like this is a long-term investment. You're not going to hire an accountant every single year um, and make sure that they share the same values with you. Um, I know that that sounds odd, but um, somebody that, that is on the same page that you are and help you with your business and help support you and share your values and how you're going to get there. Yeah, great advice. And, and I agree that uh, the first thing you said was getting over that limiting belief that, well, they, they have to be an employee. And I think that's the, the knee jerk reaction is I have a need there and that the only solution is a full time employee. And if you think about that whole process, and I've walked through this with several people, so it's like, all right, well, 
I need to put together a job description and then I have to go recruit. And then where am I going to recruit? Then I'm going to have to go uh, figure out um, a compensation plan and then I have to provide insurance. And then there's this underlying stuff that if you dig around enough, people will say, I'm just not sure I have enough work to keep them busy. Or what if I hire somebody away from another company and they basically gamble their livelihood and their family's livelihood on me? What if it doesn't work out? Mm -hmm. And then, well, I have to interview somebody and then they have to be nearby. They have to be in the same geography. They have to be available. It's like all these stars have to line up to find the right person with the right skill set, with the right values, with the right culture fit, in the right geography, at the right time. And then I got to have a place for them to sit, give them a computer, train them. It's like, oh, there's, it's this overwhelming amount of obstacles that have to be overcome. But then if you look at outsourcing, it's as simple as, well, I have a need. Um, let's go find somebody who does all this. And they can be anywhere in the country, maybe in the world. And uh, let's work out a deal. And they already have the training and the technology and the computer, and I don't have to deal with any of the HR stuff, and I only pay them when I need them, mm -hmm. why in the world would you ever hire a full-time employee? So I think, I really think this outsourcing approach is a good solution to one of the biggest problems in the industry, which is the skilled labor shortage. And certainly we mm -hmm. can't outsource to trim carpenters in Austin if you're a, a home builder in Connecticut, but Information work, I think you can subcontract information work um, just like we subcontract a lot of the other work on an as-needed basis. Maybe it's hourly, maybe it's fixed price, maybe it's monthly contract, but there's a great opportunity to do that and get what you need so that ultimately you can go do what you want, grow your business. Even if you don't want to sell or train with your extra time, go spend more time on your boat, right? Yeah. You, you, and invite your accountant. And it, yes. <laughs> Take them with you. Yes. And your coach. If you happen to have a construction business yeah. coach and your favorite podcast host. There you go. Right. Definitely. <laughs> Very important. Very important distinction there. All right. Um, so a couple more questions here. We're, uh, we're, we're running close on time. What advice would you give to somebody who's a construction business owner who is thinking, you know what, I need to find a bookkeeper or an accountant or maybe one person who can do both. But what advice would you give to that person? Go for it. Don't wait. Don't say I'll get to it. Don't say, um, I'm going to do it myself. I'll pay for somebody next year. I just don't have the money. I have seen, I can tell you horror stories for hours of how that has gone wrong and how far behind people get. Just do it. Just go for it. Dig in, find somebody that you like. Um, you know, listening to your podcast, there's people on LinkedIn, um, there's people out there that are ready to get started and to help construction companies going today. Um, but you just got to, you got to make the investment and do it today. Yeah, I, I had a client I worked with um, and for months, his action item on every call was, I'm going to get my bookkeeper started. I'm going to get my bookkeeper. He had, he had signed an agreement. I think he had paid but he just mm -hmm. hadn't gone through that little bit of effort to actually set up a meeting and get things started. So absolutely take the first step, go out on LinkedIn, ask people, even if, if you don't know where to start, go on LinkedIn and say, Hey, who is a, uh, I'm looking for an accountant. I'm looking for a bookkeeper. If you want to find somebody who's outsourced, if you want to find somebody local, whatever, but harness the power of LinkedIn and yeah, just, just get started. And, and speaking of LinkedIn, I want to talk about this for a minute you're pretty active on LinkedIn and that's actually how we got connected. What is your, how do you think about LinkedIn? How are you using it? What's, what's your strategy? What's going on behind, behind the curtain with you when it comes to LinkedIn? <laughs> I can't share all my secrets. Okay. Scott. <laughs> give, it, give us the, uh, the medium grade stuff. Um, really, I want to provide value on LinkedIn to business owners who are doing it right now, or they have a bookkeeper. They're just not ready to make the shift to keep me in mind when they are ready. Um, I want to provide value for them, um, writing articles out there of how to do it so that they can train their people or pass it on or maybe spark ideas. Um, I don't write all about accounting. I write about personal experiences too. And this morning I wrote about um, changing banks. What do, you think, what do you think about when you're changing banks? How do you go about that process? When you're changing, so really, what's that? Banks. Banks, got you're it. Gonna change a bank. Okay. Um, kind of going through that process. 
but really being top of mind. Um, we might not be a good fit today, but maybe in six months or a year when you're ready to make that investment and you've gotten over the hump of, I don't want to outsource, then you'll call us. Yeah. So obviously you can't give away your top secret stuff, but what's maybe something in the middle or some low hanging fruit. If somebody's like, you know what, this LinkedIn thing doesn't seem to be going away. I need to get started. Where should they, and they say, but I don't, I don't even know where to start. What are the mm -hmm. first couple of things you would tell them to do or how would you tell them to think about LinkedIn? So LinkedIn, like you said, is definitely not going away. There's millions of users. I forget what it, it's over 500 million users across the world. And even if you're not looking to connect to your ideal client, it has opened a whole new world for me on networking. Mm. Um, there's people out there that offer services on everything and things that I didn't even know existed. Um, there's a lady on LinkedIn who helps write pitches like killer pitches like how do you have how do you write a pitch how can i get investors and write my pitch and um workers comp when one of my clients wanted to switch and look at other workers comp plan instead of going out and doing a google search i didn't even know what the options are i can go on linkedin and who offers workers comp who is active on linkedin and who can i connect with and kind of follow them and see what they're up to mm -hmm. Um, there's construction coaches, um, you're out there, Todd, and that's how we met, but there's just a whole new world. So just go out to LinkedIn, um, start posting, also connecting with other people. You don't know who you don't know, and you don't know who you're going to find. Um, you might connect with other construction CEOs in your area that you want to network, or there's construction coaches, there's insurance agents, there's bankers. Um, it doesn't have to be narrowed down, just open it up and start connecting and start networking with other people. I would say is just get going and network with LinkedIn people. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's definitely a long-term strategy and it's huge. The, mm -hmm. the reach is huge. And um, there's a lot of people talking about LinkedIn. I've been on LinkedIn for, I don't know how long, 10 years, maybe longer. I, I don't even know, but there was very little going on. It used to be kind of annoying, these spammy messages and spammy groups and stuff, but it really seems to have gained a lot of traction now. Maybe it, I don't know how to explain it or why it's happening, but it is, it's a powerful tool. And I'm actually about to hit, I'm about to release a, um, a podcast today, uh, as soon as we get off here about four ways to, uh, four uses for social media that, um, uh, people may not think about. So I talk to people who are saying, yeah, I'm not on Facebook. I don't, I don't need LinkedIn. I just work with commercial uh, general contractors. I'm a subcontractor. Why would I be on Facebook? I'm like, well, you're, you may not be on Facebook, but your employees are mm -hmm. and your future employees are. So if you're listening to this in the future, which is the only time you could be listening to this podcast, go back and find episode 111 and listen to that too. So all right. So Nicole, we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff, but what exactly do you do? How can you help construction mm -hmm. business owners and uh, what should they do if they want to get in touch with you? Absolutely. So we are an accounting firm and we specialize in construction accounting. All of our clients were across the U S they outsource to us where they don't have anybody or they might have one person in house and they just need another layer of accounting or they say, we don't want to do it at all. You do it all. So they outsource all of their accounting. Um, we'll help them with system integrations. We can do one-off projects, consulting engagements, um, the monthly accounting, day-to-day -day accounting to CFO level services, depending on what they're wanting to accomplish. Um, but we are located in Denver, but we are outsourced. We actually only have one client in Colorado. So we are across the United States. Um, the best way to get in reach with us is go out to our website www.landout, L-A-N-D-A-U, consultingsolutions.com and schedule a call. Let's hop on a call and see how we can partner together and if it would be um, a good fit for us to take over your accounting function. And if you want more information, I write articles on LinkedIn, um, how to do your spring cleaning on your accounting books. Um, I also have a background in fraud. 
I am a certified fraud examiner. Not that I want to use it on anybody, but sometimes it does come in handy. So I write some fraud articles from time to time. Um, so you can go out there and see articles and see my activity on LinkedIn as well. But first and foremost, go to our website, schedule a call and let's chat. Great stuff. Well, Nicole, this has been great. Thanks for all the great advice and for being generous with your time and information. And uh, I'll have some links and more information at the end of this podcast. If you want to get in touch with Nicole, I'll send you to the show notes where you can get all the links and all that stuff. So great stuff. Thanks, Nicole. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. There you go. Hope you enjoyed that. For all the show notes from this podcast, go to constructionleadingedge.com slash 113 for episode 113. All the links will be there. Be sure to go to my website, constructionleadingedge.com. Click on the red button that says webinars and training. Go grab all the free resources there. If you would like to talk about working with me one-on-one -on -one to help you grow your business, eliminate chaos, get things where you want them to be, you can go to my website, constructionleadingedge.com, and click on the red button that says book your free call. And uh, I want to read a review that came in on iTunes. This is from Jones Construction Solutions. And he says this, I've been listening to this podcast for a little over a year now. I had the pleasure of meeting Todd at the Advance in Fort Myers, Florida last week. What a great experience. If you're a construction business owner like me, I strongly recommend this podcast or any other event that Todd is hosting. I appreciate that, Toby. And yeah, we did get to hang out. So if you could uh, leave a rating and or a review on iTunes, that would be fantastic. It'll take you about 60 seconds to do that. I would appreciate that. Helps get the word out to the rest of the interwebs. And uh, yeah, I'll be doing some more live events. Planning on a live event in Kentucky in October. It's going to be the Advance Fall 2019. Keep your eyes out for that if you're interested. Um, watch your email inbox. There's going to be some early bird pricing that you're going to want to jump on that before spots fill up. So there you go. Make sure and go to fieldchat.com slash edge. Grab your free trial. Take advantage of that offer from those folks. They'll help you eliminate chaos and streamline communications on your business. And I think that's it for now. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me. And if you're like, I don't know what, I, I, if you need information, um, go to the website, constructionleadingedge.com. You could probably find it there. If nothing else, hit the contact button, send me a message, and I'll help you out however I can. Thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.